the presentation I'm giving today um, is uh, joined with Ines and uh, with Tim Susanucci, who has been uh, working with us uh, on this particular paper. The paper both fits into the uh, equal uh, context uh, of sort of trying to just basically come up with some relatively, um, I would say, straightforward, quite descriptive, but it's just sort of trying to say what can you say and what can't you say based on what's out there. And part of it is, is actually somewhat motivated by something that has bothered me for quite some time. Um, and this was very much part of uh, the, the work uh, when I was in, in, in Union Wider. I mean, we were sort of in this situation that we were sort of saying, well, uh, global inequality is going down. And UNRIST, another UN agency, would say, no, 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 global inequality is going up. Um, and, and I kind of, yeah, so that sort of got us going on, on trying to be more careful. And this is really just meant as a, a careful descriptive presentation of what we can say and what we can't say uh, based on available data, including uh, the, the massive work that Carlos has done on, on, on the way. Um, uh, I should also just say that it also reflects a, a request uh, from uh, the Handbook of uh, Labour, uh, Human Resources and uh, Population that wanted uh, this type of work done, so we, we thought we would pursue it. It's a study uh, supported, uh, as Rachel has already uh, indicated by NNF, and I'm going to try to just introduce, and then I'm going to try to say something about trends in poverty, inequality and growth, and then I'll say a little bit about uh, implications for policy responses, but I'm actually very much hoping uh, that, that that can be a topic for uh, our discussion round, and there will also be the plenary later on today, which would sort of uh, speak directly to this. Okay, poverty and inequality, uh, promoting inclusive growth of fundamental to achieving the SDGs, and we know that much has changed uh, in the global economy in, in, in recent decades, um, so it, it's really important that one sort of uh, understands that perspectives vary a lot. And I already just mentioned these two UN agencies that are supposed to be sort of almost like a brother and a sister uh, saying different things, right? So, um, and of course, this is highlighted by the fact that we've now had the COVID crisis, which has then also led to some quite uh, strong differences in, in statements about how people see the impact of the crisis. So um, we thought that, okay, let's try to, uh, to just uh, come up with this, uh, what can we say about trends? And it's really just uh, to, to, to try to, to put out the, 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 uh, the stylized facts. And, and, and I will just give a few summary indications, but I'll, I'll refer you to the paper um, uh, for, for all of the sort of more background about, okay, which are the concepts, how have we defined them, and so on. Um, the first sort of insight that jumps to one's mind when one goes through this is that the world is really more heterogeneous than, than we often kind of pretend in the public debates. And it's really important that we keep that in mind uh, because it does mean that many of the generalizations that people come up with in effect can be terribly wrong when you are in more specific circumstances. So that's sort of one thing um, that one should keep in mind. Um, and, and another dimension of this is that the portrait of reality that one ends up with depends heavily on the conceptual measurement issues. I mean, the conceptual one, for example, has already been referred to in terms of this relative absolute. And I was actually stunned when we sort of tried to go through the literature and saw that there was nobody who was looking, or nobody, that's exaggerating a bit, but, but actually very, very few took the absolute approach to trying to analyze this. And this is said by somebody who did his uh, master's thesis a long time ago, uh, studying uh, the impact um, so, um, I mean, um, the, the, the sort of issues are, well, I mean, looking at poverty rates or absolutely number of poor, poor people, what are the choices of cutoffs uh, that you're using, uh, and so on. This is the first sort of thing where we think we can say something about uh, with some kind of reasonable uh, clarity. It's pretty clear that uh, the poverty rate has been going, going down quite systematically for quite some time, um, except that uh, in the African context, where it also has gone down. But at the same time, um, when we look at the uh, number of poor people, um, uh, then that is actually uh, 
not shown the same um, improvement, certainly not when you look at the sub Saharan Africa. So that's sort of something to sort of keep in mind. You need to look at both shares, rates, and absolute numbers to try to kind of uh, understand what's going on. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's kind of what does stand out. But this is a relatively uh, that I think we can allow ourselves uh, to, to use. Now, it's also very clear that while we can say that there has been a lot of progress in the world, it is very clear um, that China had only counted two thirds of the reduction in the poverty rate in the 1980s. So, what that means is that, hey, wait a second, do look at the disaggregated data as well, uh, not to uh, kind of uh, miss that things might actually be very heterogeneous, as I mentioned. Um, the sort of progress we've seen in, in, in China or Vietnam, for that matter, is very different from what we see in the case of Africa. The decreasing numbers of absolute poor at the one point nine dollar uh, line, um, except for some of these, accompanied by increasing numbers of poor according to the living standards of the country where they live. So even if we have seen the poverty rate going down, the numbers of poor according to the living standards where they live in the country they live have actually gone up. So that again is, is something that one should really keep in mind when one is discussing uh, how are things going. And while data remains scarce, it's pretty clear that the COVID-19 pandemic and the consequent economic recession have had dramatic impact on poverty reduction globally. There's been an increase in the uh, global poverty rate in recent years, in the last three years. And this has been, um, we, we've tried to go into this in some separate work, where you saw a presentation on the Tanzania study by David, who's here um, yesterday. Um, there are also um, sort of discussions uh, around what might have happened um, to inequality. Um, but, but I mean, but what I think I, I want to need to say here is that even if the global relative inequality measured by the Gini had tended downwards for several decades, this reflects only to some extent the variability in regional trends. And, and we've had sessions here already uh, which have shown how variable uh, the, the developments are between the different, uh, the different regions. And then further, one insight is that wealth is far more unequally distributed than income. And that again, when you listen to the debates and the public discussions around, uh, sometimes people don't even distinguish between income and wealth. Uh, and so on. Again, here, there's something to really keep in mind. When we talk about measurement of inequality, it, with great care, it's obviously needed uh, when you're making statements about what has happened. Um, and, and, and this is in line with a paper that I use in practically all of the sort of presentation of this type of work that I'm referring to, namely a paper by Martin Rebellion, which first came out as a wider working paper, and it's now in uh, a book that I'll show you at the end. It's probably the best paper um, along sort of these lines of saying how careful you need to be um, when you are making uh, statements. Uh, and he really traces this literature in an absolutely incredibly clear way. Um, I made reference to the uh, decline in global inequality when you're using the most widely uh, relative measures. Uh, in uh, recent decades, and that is driven by falling between country inequality um, and uh, when, uh, within um, uh, country inequalities, either constant or slightly uh, increasing. And you can see that in this graph here, uh, where we have uh, very much also drawn on um, uh, Carlos's work with a vid. But, but this is sort of uh, based on a relatively careful going through the data and showing uh, that this is actually the, the sort of picture. However, when global inequality is measured in absolute terms, then you see a highly dramatic increase stand out. I mean, the red line is, is, is pretty clear, right? I mean, so, so, so one needs to be, again, here, <laughs> very, very careful in terms of what it is uh, that you're actually uh, trying uh, to uh, show or trying to discuss and this obviously has also implications for 
um, thinking about policy. What is it that you want to achieve? And I mean, one sort of reason why, why I'm particularly interested in this is also because this is sitting at the very sort of core of why economists and, and anthropologists often can't speak with each other. I mean, this was, I was first confronted with this very, very starkly in the case of Vietnam, um, because, I mean, my anthropology friends, they, they basically insisted that we as economists, we were getting development in Vietnam wrong. I mean, they, they, and, and this, this was very much related to this relative absolute in all kinds of things, where they would take a very absolute type approach. So if there was still a little bit of gender inequality in some place, things were wrong. And I sort of, of course, I, I understand that at some level, but when we were thinking about gender inequality and the, the measures we would typically use, we would see improvements. Um, now, I should say uh, that there are many hypotheses about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on inequality. And I, I, I wanna say that assessments vary reflecting the distinct lack of hard data. So here is, here is a warning, uh, at least the way I see it, is that you will see a lot of people arguing very strongly that this is the way it has gone. But actually, and we have tried to sift very, very carefully through, um, yeah, I mean, the pandemic probably led to some increase in relative inequality and a decrease in absolute uh, inequality. But you really need to be very careful here, and, and um, uh, Angus Deaton is out trying to say you actually need to be careful here also because uh, China, how China sort of plays into this, could actually be outweighing it. Um, I mean, in the same way as where we've seen progress, uh, this has, for example, been accompanied uh, by um, increasing, uh, sorry, um, increasing poverty in absolute terms that when, when, when you sort of go in reverse, it should be the opposite. That's basically his argument. But I, I hear, I just want to sort of say that the jury is still out. And this has to do with the fact that, well, who were really hardest hit? Um, well, I mean, uh, in absolute terms, maybe it was the richest or the more, higher groups in, 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 in urban centers. Um, because they lost most in absolute terms. But was it more in relative terms? Well, you know, and maybe some of the rural areas were not quite as much hard hit in absolute terms, but maybe it led to them falling below the poverty line because they're sort of close to the poverty line. Now they end up being poor. So uh, th there are still many unresolved uh, questions here. But, uh, but what I think we should definitely keep in mind is that the COVID-19 impact on growth and the dynamic and medium to longer term effects on poverty and inequality. I mean, here we can definitely put forward um, ideas about that this is probably having negative impacts because the poor and the vulnerable members, members in society are, are, are the ones who, who cannot really bear much pressure down. So even if it's not so much, and even if some of our economic analysis would suggest that they may not have lost as much in relative terms as, 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 the, um, as the rich, then uh, th they might actually end up being trapped. And then there are longer term uh, consequences. Um, in terms of uh, trends in growth, well, I just sort of say here that the analysis of relative and absolute growth in sensitive curves and the effect on economic growth and global inequality distribution. And here, I mean, it's, it, it's clear that the elephant chart, which is sort of, I mean, by now, sort of a standard in this, in this literature, uh, it's very clear that the very top of the global income distribution gained significantly from economic growth uh, between 1988 and uh, 2008. I mean, that's sort, of, that's sort of the curve that sort of uh, hits the x-axis at around the 80th percentile, um, showing that they had, had very little uh, growth in their income, whereas the, the what do you call it, uh, in English, uh, the, the, the elephant's uh, nose, <laughs> trunk, the elephant's trunk uh, is really going up very much, right? Uh, showing that they are the ones who really had the highest uh, growth rate. Ravalian looked at this, and this is, this is where, in these types of questions, it's really very often advisable to take a look at, at, at Ravalian's work, because then he comes out and says, yeah, yeah, uh, sure, there's an elephant. If you choose a particular way 
of looking at particular concepts and so on, if you actually t take an absolute perspective, yeah, it's very clear that the very richest uh, uh, pertinent side uh, of the income distribution gained enormously, um, but uh, and that the poor and the middle class in developing countries actually gained very little. But when you then look at it in absolute terms, then the shape of the animal changes completely and it becomes uh, a serpentile instead. And again here, it, it's sort of to bring home this point, be very specific and very clear uh, in terms of uh, the, the types of concepts that you're using when you're discussing what is happening. Um, now, um, uh, Carlos uh, has been working on updating uh, this, and, and what, uh, what, what seems sort of clear is that the serpent continues to, the, uh, to, to emerge, while the elephant pattern is kind of more fading uh, in terms of the more recent data. Um, but, yeah. So, what are the implications for uh, policy responses? I mean, so w while the links between poverty and equality and growth are uh, conflict, uh, sorry, complex, the available estimates sort of agree uh, in a short time uh, that the COVID-19 shock reversed, I mean, very significantly reversed uh, a lot of the progress in terms of uh, fighting poverty. And that obviously will make the uh, achievement uh, of the SDGs uh, very, very difficult. Um, it's not wrong to say now that we are not going to get anywhere near uh, achieving the SDG one. I mean, and, and it, it's something that probably already should now start being said more loudly uh, in terms of what's happening in the policy debates. So social protection policies, they are obviously for these reasons getting into the center of a lot of our policy debates because we've seen this massive shock. Um, so, I mean, it's clear that, that, that uh, th th this sort of jumps into one's head right away. Well, you need to do something. But obviously it's clear that many governments are very constrained in these areas. I mean, I myself have been working in the Mozambican context where the capacity of the government to actually pursue these types of social protection policies is extremely constrained. I mean, just getting the job done is not something you don't just push a button um, and, and, and that needs to be thought about. But at the same time, there clearly is a need to be aware that the labor market is the key uh, way in which uh, income for the poor develops. I mean, what is, the, what is the capital that the poor has? Well, I mean, it's the labor ca ca capability. So that is absolutely critical uh, in thinking about this when we discuss policy. I have one added uh, comment here, which is just that I am hoping that the same awareness uh, will also develop in relation to support food production and the production of uh, protection of food supply chains. And I should say this, is, this was written before the Ukraine uh, crisis hit in. But I mean, this is a recurring theme that lots of those who participate in these debates, they tend to forget agriculture, food, food supply chains, etc. when we are talking about these topics in policy uh, circles. And then it's very clear that the restrictions imposed during the pandemic have highlighted once more the need to build resilience among the poor and vul uh, vulnerable. I mean, it, it really stands out as, 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 as something that is so incredibly uh, central to what we need to do uh, also with a view to the future. Now, this has developed a lot more in this book, which I made reference to in the beginning. Uh, quite a few of the, of, of the stylized facts are also reflected uh, in this book. Thank you very much for your attention.